Welcome to Butterflies of the Biosphere. I'm Dan Danaha and with me today is... David Harris. So David Harris is a species champion for the small blue butterfly, um, uh, one of the species champions for the Sussex branch. Is that right, Dave? That's correct, yes. So where have you brought me today, Dave? Well, we're at the back of New Haven, Denton in fact, in a place called Stump Bottom, which is tucked away in a valley the other side of the main part of the town. And as you can see from this morning, it's a cracking little valley. You've got a whole range of different habitats here, from the broken chalk right the way down in the valley bottom to the lank vegetation, rank vegetation down there. And because you, sorry, early, Dave, can you see down there? Look, on the uh, stem, there's a small blue there. Is there? I can't can you actually, right there? Oh, yes, I'm with you now. Yes. Fabulous. So it just goes to show, doesn't it, that when you come and look for these butterflies in the correct habitats you very often find them particularly if the weather's nice like it is today and it is a fantastic day for photographing and filming butterflies because of course as maybe can be illustrated right now the sun's gone in uh, that means the butterflies will become a little bit less active and they'll be sitting there waiting for you to film them or to photograph let's hope so yes let's move on shall we indeed yeah. i think one of the most interesting things about this insect is that it's an early successional butterfly one that that soon colonizes new habitats so really you need to continuously recreate habitats don't you so that things like the food plant the kidney vetch can come in which doesn't last long if you don't do that does it it doesn't no as soon as the long grasses overtake the kidney vetch that's probably the spell the end of the kidney vetch but it's true the butterfly does tend to occur in man-made habitats quite often things like um, quarries and roadside embankments and even where you're clearing away cliffs to uh, create uh, promenades for people to walk along so you can find it in uh, almost anywhere where there's uh, broken chalk or or limestone well i have and to say actually we were really excited at the liz williams uh, butterfly haven uh, in brighton when it was one of our first exciting species i mean we got things like meadow browns and uh, common blues fairly soon but as soon as that came in, I thought, wow, we we're onto something here. Yes, it did surprise me there that you found it because uh, it's supposed to not be very mobile, but obviously it's uh, flown in from quite a long way away just to find your little haven there, and it's obviously found a, a home that's perfect for it. And you know what, Dave? I, more and more and more I learn about butterflies, more I realise, in fact, that well, in the case of something like the small blue, we're talking about something which has to move from site to site, aren't we? Otherwise it doesn't survive. And so therefore, you think about it, here's an insect which has got wings, it's got antennae which are the most incredible directional noses. They're designed to find new places. So whatever we might read in the books, whatever we might hear from other people, my view is, is that these animals are designed to disperse throughout the landscape, which is why landscape conservation approaches which are now being used are so successful. I, I quite agree and certainly in the case of the small blue it relies upon these little fragmented areas that are being turned over all the time um, for the seed bank that's in the soil to have a chance for the, the, the food plant the, the kidney vetch to germinate so it is vital to have these little areas set aside uh, that people can occasionally come along and disturb uh, to, to, to create the environment for the butterfly to thrive. Exactly. And uh, I, was, yeah. I was really thrilled to hear that you've had success well, at your... Well, um, another similar site, which was just up the road at Hollingbury in Brighton, we counted in the first year a 1,000 individuals. That was astonishing. That is, they can build up numbers very, very quickly, particularly when they just moved into a site. Um, and I think you've had one or two other sites uh, around that area where you've also had quite large numbers. I mean, certainly anything over 100 butterflies is quite a, a large colony of small blues, really, but the 1,000 is pretty remarkable. And it was. Well, Dave, that, that is a beautiful-looking butterfly, and exactly where we thought we might find it, stuck in the brachypodium like that. Oh, look what it's doing. Yes, it's a curious little manoeuvre, isn't it? What, they, do you, what do you think that's about? Why do you think it's doing it? I suspect it's probably because we've got a little bit of cloud today and as the cloud cover comes over it tries to keep its flight muscles as warmed up as possible and the rubbing of the wings is partly an effort to keep those flight muscles toned. Jeez. But I think also that a little bit of the manoeuvring around there is to get the best position when the sun does come through, oh, yes. but also to um, try and uh, attract any passing uh, small blue that might be interested in, uh, in, in, in its attentions. This is a really <laughs> interesting moment, Dave, isn't it? Because it's, the sun's just gone in and uh, it's hunkered right down there. It is, and you'll find that in quite a few sites that as soon as the 
cloud cover comes along and the temperature drops, they'll go down into the longer grasses, they'll hide away for a while. You often find there's more than one together, they're quite a colonial species, so they tend to group together. And as soon as the, uh, the cloud disappears and the sunshine comes out again, they'll open their wings, uh, warm up a little bit, and then off they'll, they'll fly again. They're, they're really beautiful and, 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 and they're, well, they're amazing because they're, they're, they're Britain's smallest butterfly, aren't they? They are. They're, and, they're... and what they can put up with is incredible. Astonishing, yes, and they, they get buffeted by the winds and you often find them in quite exposed um, situations. Uh, and particularly in the last few years, it has been very windy indeed and they've had to endure a lot. But I guess because they are so small, they've got so little surface area of their wings, they're probably going to suffer from buffeting a lot less than some of the large butterflies. I think there's certainly that tends to be the, the case and you can see them flying in quite, quite windy weather indeed and, and making progress against the wind. That's the other thing which I quite like about this species is how when it when it does fly, it, because you've got the grey on the top and and the and uh, or the slate grey on the top, and then this very very light underwing. When it actually flies, it does look bluey, doesn't it? It does. Yes, it's a very smoky grey underside, and um, it gives the impression of one minute being there and the next minute disappearing as the wings um, flap up and down. It, it's a very jinky flight, and uh, it's difficult to keep your eye on it all the time. So what can you tell me about the caterpillar stage of this insect? Well, it's a fascinating life history really for the caterpillar because obviously the female lays the eggs on the new flowers and the caterpillar then bores into the flower head itself and starts devouring the uh, developing seed pod. But um, it has a habit of, if it meets another one of its uh, uh, brothers or, or cousins on the same seed, it'll actually start eating, uh, it's cannibalistic, So not say. like the, not dislike the, uh, the orange tip that we just were talking about in our last uh, edition? Very similar indeed, it's not a nice, nice end is it, if you happen to be no. in the wrong seed at the wrong time. And then after that of course, um, the caterpillar will eventually emerge, when it gets a little bit bigger, it'll emerge onto the outside of the seed head and it'll start feeding between the seeds themselves. And at that stage, um, if ants encounter it, the ants will look after it and they'll tend it and they'll try and keep the uh, parasites uh, away from the caterpillar. And wow. it's got a particular affiliation with the black field ant, the, the garden ant, the uh, Laceus niger. And not infrequently you can find the fully grown caterpillars and the pupae um, around and about the nests of the uh, field ant. Have you found them? I have found them in recent years, yes. Um, it seems to be on mainland Europe, that seems to be slightly more common than in the UK, but I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done here to find out exactly what its relationship is with the ants, but it's certainly a, uh, an interesting part of its life cycle indeed. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough once, I was with uh, Martin Warren when we did the big butterfly race, and uh, and one of the things that we, we, we planned to do was give more points for people finding the immature stages of the butterflies. Um, and so uh, Martin duly found us a small blue caterpillar amongst a, the, a seed head. In fact, I think I might even have that. I might that, edit that in right here and now so people can see what it looks like. But they're incredibly maggot-like, aren't they? They are. They're, they're, they're tiny little things, really. And they mimic the seed heads when they do emerge onto the outside to feed so closely that unless you've got a trained eye or you've seen them yeah. before, it's very easy to overlook them and in fact occasionally you can if you're lucky enough you can find more than one caterpillar on the seed head itself because when they get slightly older they lose that cannibalistic well, tendency well, they, tolerate one another, they will put up with, with each other a interesting little bit more. that on one seed head can support two caterpillars because the seed heads themselves aren't that big are they no they're not but then again i suppose being a small butterfly it doesn't really need a huge amount of food to feed on and yes. so probably one or two seed heads will just about do it really fabulous So Dave, we're on the eastern edge of the Brighton and Lewis Downs Biosphere Reserve. If I wanted to get here by car, how would I do that? 
Probably the easiest way would be to come along the A27 and then drop down the A26. How about buses? Any ideas? Buses, yes. I think you could probably come along the coastal strip between Brighton and Eastbourne using, I think it's the number 12 or 12A bus. Or alternatively, um, you could come down from Lewis on the Lewis to New Haven bus. I think it's the number 123, but I might be wrong there. Well, I suppose we've got tr the train, haven't we? Train too, yes. Uh, disembark at uh, New Haven Town uh, Station and then just walk over the river and you're, you're almost here. Fabulous. Well, if you want to see the small blue, uh, Denton's really a good spot. However, you can also see it in Brighton Hove. You know, I'm aware of a place on Rottingdean along the seafront there. But also you can come to the Liz Williams Butterfly Haven on the Sorenden campus, which is part of where Dorothy Stringer School is. Well, Dave, it's been a fantastic time. I really appreciate the time you've given me to show me this beautiful butterfly. It's been a pleasure meeting up with you and it's been a lovely day too, hasn't it?